If you would like to support the channel, please consider becoming a patron on Patreon. More information in the description below. Hey, this is your official content warning. Fatal Frame features violent imagery and difficult themes including self-harm and torture. Not your vibe? That is A-OK. -okay. See you in the next video. Something evil lies within the mountain. It's a gate, an entrance to the land of the dead. And for time untold, it's been held shut through a diligent ritual. There was never documentation kept about the Hellgate. How it was discovered, how the rituals were found, who built the structures about it are all unknown. It wasn't until the 1800s that records began. By then, the Hellgate had been successfully resealed countless times, and those that stood guard over it were the Hamuro family. Should the rituals ever fail, a calamity would occur. Malice would pour forth from hell itself, and whatever life it claimed would be fated to roam the land of the living trapped in their final moments of torment and frenzied fear again and again. But the Homero family prevented that terror, ever diligent, ever aware of it, and unyielding in their obligation. But how was the Hell Gate kept closed? Well, my friends, ready yourself for that terrible truth. For simplicity's sake, we'll begin with a game. It's called Demon Tag, and only girls of the family may play it. Those who are older than 7 years, 9 months, and 25 days may participate. It is overseen by the head of the Hamuro family. Near the end of the month of November, the game takes place. The one who is it is surrounded by a group of girls. The one who is it represents the demons of hell. Now, this might be a more traditional game of tag that we know, where the demon who is it runs to chase down the girls in the room. Or it may be a game of song and guess, where the demon must listen and decide who is behind them when the singing ends. Either way, the result is the same. The first girl to be found will be the next demon in the ritual cycle, for she was the most visible to the demon, the one who drew its attention. So at the next ritual cycle, she would be the blinded maiden. Each girl caught after was of no consequence until the final girl remained. She was the most resistant to the demon that sought her, therefore, she was the one with the most holy power. And in the next cycle, she would be the Rope Shrine Maiden. The newly appointed Blinded Maiden will go about her life, perhaps completely unaware of what her future will hold. And the newly appointed Rope Shrine Maiden will be kept within the Homero Mansion, cut off from the outside world, for ten years. It's unknown if the Blinded Maiden was made aware of what her fate will be, and we will talk about that in a moment. But the Rope Shrine Maiden, she was made fully aware of precisely what was to come and the expectations placed upon her. She would spend the next decade shedding all worldly ties, having little interaction with anyone who wasn't a priest or a high member of the family. She would learn well the strangling ritual that was to be her fate. She would come to embrace it and welcome it because without her, the calamity would come. If she failed, her family would die. All around the region would fall victim to it. She would be their savior, so she had to succeed. In her isolation, she had very little from the outside world, so that she never developed bonds to anything. Her attendants wore masks, and only once she was in complete compliance with her duties would she rarely be allowed to venture out beyond her holding area, her prison. Then, ten years later, the two maidens carried out their destinies. At the end of the month of November, the entirety of the Himero family would travel to the manor to observe the ritual, and that game Demon Tag would begin anew. The now young woman who was selected a decade prior as the next blind maiden would be taken away for the game. In the blinding realm, the head of the Himero family residing over the processes donned the mask of reflection and was joined by masked priests serving the family. The maiden was forced to kneel, and the head of the family forced the blinding mask onto her face, pushing nails into her eyes. Do you see how the game comes full circle? Because then, the game of demon tag. She would be the heart of the game. She was the demon in the middle, and she would select the next cycle's blind maiden and rope shrine maiden. Once those two girls were selected, their decade of waiting and preparing began. But in the meantime, this cycle's blinded maiden would wait with that mask on her face until the 13th of December. The rope shrine maiden was made ready through private ceremony. On December 12th, the maiden would be taken to the moon well so that she might climb into it and cleanse herself under the light of the moon. Then alone, she would use a hairpin key to pass through a door in the well, down a path that only she may walk. 
to the guts of the mansion just beyond the demon mouth, and there she would wait. When December the 13th began, all the inhabitants of the land locked their doors and their windows. They would not venture outside. To do so was considered extremely bad luck. All those outside of the Hamuro family had no idea what exactly was happening beneath the estate. While the rope shrine maiden waited, the blind maiden played her part. The blind maiden, the head of the Hamuro family, four masked priests, and congregates from the family all gathered before the demon mouth. Because the blind maiden was the first one caught during demon tag ten years prior, she was deemed the most distracting to the demons. The mask which was now covered in her blood was the key to the demon mouth. It would hold the attention of any demons that neared it. With her duty fulfilled, the blind maiden was taken away. Whether they lived or died was of no consequence, and no record was kept of such things. Now, the rope shrine maiden, the head of the Hamuro family, four masked priests, and the congregants proceeded on to the hell gate. The congregants waited outside the strangling room to pray and observe the terrible sounds. Upon the rope altar, the strangling ritual would take place. The maiden laid upon the altar all on her own and with complete willingness. The masked priests would each wrap a rope around her limbs and the head of the family would wrap the last rope around her neck. Each rope was attached to a mechanism that would pull the ropes tight. One turn at a time, they grew tighter and tighter, pulling at her limbs and her head. The maiden had spent a decade preparing herself for this, knowing exactly what was going to be done to her. She met a violent death on the altar, and the ropes were drenched with her blood. Her Murrow family congregants would come forth to attend to her corpse. The dismembered body of the rope shrine maiden was interred into jars and placed within the moon shrine, alongside all the other maidens that came before her. Deeper within the mountain was the Hell Gate itself. The Holy Mirror was placed into a stone before the Hell Gate to ensure that the evil within was kept at bay. Then the priests and the family leader changed out the ropes while remaining family congregants prayed for protection. If all was done correctly, the blood of the rope shrine maiden would keep it sealed for ten more years, and then this decade-long process would be repeated. And for countless cycles, the Hamuro family had done this. In 1827, the next maidens were chosen. The rope shrine maiden was Kiri Himuro. For 10 years, she would be confined to and indoctrinated in the mansion. Taken from her family, all ties to the outside world cut, she would have a difficult and lonely adolescence. But with time, Kiri became compliant with her fate and wished to see the strangling ritual through. As had been done with rope shrine maidens before, as Kiri got older and her commitment deepened, she was allowed a bit more freedom. She could rarely have strangers visit, though under very controlled circumstances. She was allowed occasional access to the cherry atrium, rooms around her holding area, and she could look out windows. In the year 1837, the same year the strangling ritual would be held, Carrie spotted a young man outside her window, walking in the garden. The two made eye contact, and I'm sure you can see where this is going. They met face to face when she was freed from her holding area for a time, and they hit it off. He came to visit her as much as he could, and they made each other happy. Kiri developed a worldly bond with him, and she told the chief priest about it. She didn't realize that she was doing something wrong, that she was doing something dangerous to the ritual. But the young man made her less lonely, and they adored each other's company. So, to stop this blossoming love, the chief priest ordered the young man taken away and killed. This was the norm when it came to people who got too close to the rope shrine maidens. They were quietly disposed of, never allowed to leave the mansion. Kiri was told that the young man had gone home, that they wouldn't be seeing each other again. It was a deep sadness for her. She just wanted to see him again because soon she wouldn't be able to. And then she dreamt of him. And in her heart, she knew that he had not actually abandoned her. He'd been murdered. Kiri's heart broke, and she struggled to understand and process her grief and guilt. She'd never been given the emotional tools for something like this, and she felt responsible for what happened to him. She just so badly wanted to be with him again, but no remedy came for that feeling of loss. In November, the Homero family gathered at the estate. The blinding ritual was carried out, and the next game of demon tag took place. December 13th was fast approaching, and Kiri doubted that she would be able to play her part. She had felt the joy of life. She missed the young man that she had known for that brief time, and it conflicted with what she knew she was meant to be. Then she had a dream. 
A man in armor came to her and told her to break the holy mirror, the one that safeguarded the hell gate when the ropes were being changed, and then she could see her love once again. So, in secret, Kiri went to the holy mirror and she sabotaged it, so that it would break if any pressure was placed upon it. The priests knew that Kiri was depressed and anxious. They too were concerned that she would fail as the maiden, but it was far, far too late to find a substitution. They just had to have faith in her resolve. So on the night of December the 12th, the ritual process began. Kiri Hamuro was taken to the moon well to descend into it alone to bathe under the purifying light of the moon. She would meet the rest of the ritual congregants beyond the demon mouth once her cleansing was complete. The walk there was one that she had to make on her own. Meanwhile, on December the 13th, the blinded maiden was taken underground to the demon mouth. The mouth was opened by the bloodied mask of the blinded maiden after it was taken from her face. With her duties complete, the blinded maiden was removed from the underground. Then the family leader, the priests, the congregants, and the rope shrine maiden met in the underground to walk the band path together towards where the strangling ritual would take place. But there were clear signs of trouble. Kiri began to despair and called out that she wanted to see her lost love one more time. Regardless of this, the ritual continued on. Kiri was forced onto the rope altar and her limbs and neck were restrained. The Homuro family was out of time, they had no choice but to proceed on with the unwilling maiden. Kiri writhed against the ropes as they were pulled tighter and tighter. Slowly her limbs and her head were pulled from her body. Her blood seeped into the ropes that had held her, and as had been done countless times before, the priests and the family leader carried them on to the hell gate. They put the sabotaged holy mirror into its pedestal and began replacing the old ropes. Once they were done, the hell gate began to push against the new ropes, and they snapped against it. The hell gate flew open, and the holy mirror, meant to keep back the demons, shattered into five pieces. With nothing to keep it back, pure malice began to flood the mountain. Clean deaths did not come to the entirety of the Homero family. The leader of the family became maddened. He began to stalk and hunt down everyone on the estate that wasn't driven insane by the malice. Family turned on family, suicides began, and even inhabitants nearby the mansion joined in. By the end of it, 1,347 people were dead. It became known as the Calamity, and the mountain was abandoned. It was a small, pure soul that saved everything outside the mountain. Kiri's spirit had split into two. One was the primary part of her. It was the one corrupted by malice that was full of hatred for the world and the other was a much smaller part of her that was untouched, that wished to see her duties fulfilled, that wanted to save lives. The pure part of Kiri that remained took the five shattered pieces of the holy mirror to shrines around the estate, which acted as a barrier, keeping the malice and the spirits of the mansion confined. The outside world would be safe from its spread, but anyone who ventured onto the estate would not be protected from what roamed within. The loss of Homero Mountain was of course noticed by the outside world, but it became such a topic of fear and superstition that few knew of its location and what really happened there. But with time, human curiosity led foolish venturers to explore the secrets of the mountain. This video is supported by patrons on Patreon and YouTube members. You know what's scary? Taxes! Traffic! Grandma! You know what's not scary? Patreon and YouTube member. Starting at just two bucks a month, you can help support the channel. See that puppy? It's like extra and early content. See this sweet little burb? It's like Patreon and members only streams. Safe, happy, kittens. If you want to help keep the channels going, check out the description for more information on how to become a patron on Patreon or a YouTube member. Now, back to the lore. Throughout the coming century, there were a few brave souls that went to see and explore Homero Mansion. It's believed that a folklorist that went into the mountain in the early 1900s used one of the holy mirror pieces to create a special camera. The mirror piece allowed for the user to see spirits and apparitions through it, to capture their image and to quell them using the camera itself. However, it also took a terrible toll on the user. Those most sensitive to spiritual activity could be driven insane by interacting with that realm, and that special camera was a direct connection to it. 
Within the realm of this particular story, I can't say for sure what happened to the camera's creator, but I think it's safe to say they didn't meet a pleasant end in the mansion. No one had a pleasant exit after going to that place. About the mid-1900s, a family moved in. The Municados were wholly unprepared for what was within it. Ryozo Munakata was a writer who became interested in the mountain after a visit to the area, so he moved his wife and daughter there to be with him while he studied it. His wife, Yae, was a sickly woman that struggled with day-to-day -day activities, but the mountain air and open spaces did her quite a bit of good, and his daughter, Makoto, who was seven years old, took to making friends and playing around the mountain in no time. Ryozo was happy to be at his wife's side as much as she needed, and thrilled to see his daughter making friends and playing. Even though Yai wasn't fond of the creepy mansion they lived in, he vowed to get it cleaned up so that she would be happy there. Ryozo had a hard time with the locals, though. No one wanted to open up about the mansion or the mountain. He said that they were standoffish towards him. He'd learned the names of a few rituals and old titles relating to the rope shrine maiden and the calamity, but his research was slow and difficult. He was far from having the whole picture. Not long after their arrival, Makoto began playing demon tag with her friends. During the month of June, while playing demon tag, Makoto came to possess that special camera. The little girl claimed that a girl in a white kimono had given it to her, and her father didn't see any harm in the girl having it, it didn't really look that special to him. But when Yai saw Makoto with the camera, she decided to confiscate it. Yai was more spiritually attuned than Ryozo and felt some sort of power within the camera. Yai began taking photos and discovered that the images revealed things that couldn't otherwise be seen, terrible things. Makoto begged to have the camera back, but her mother slowly became obsessive over it and refused to let the girl use it in order to protect her. It only took a few days for Yai's mental and physical health to decline. By the 19th of June, she was confined to her bed. While her mother was bedbound, Makoto stole away the camera and began taking photos. On the 24th of June, Makoto went missing. She had been playing demon tag with four of her friends using the camera. All of them vanished in the mountains. No trace of them could ever be found. And soon after, Yai took her own life by hanging herself from a tree in the garden. She was tormented by the spirits of the mansion, and at the end, she could see them even without the camera. Ryozo found the blinding mask, and he took it to the demon mouth. When he opened it, it was the corrupted and vile spirit of Kiri that killed him. On July 3rd, the police were contacted about three missing children. It's not clear if a new set of children had gone missing that day or what became of the four kids that went missing in June, but that's when official records of disappearances began. None of Makoto's friends were ever found, but she was. Three days after searches began, Makoto was found by a local man called Mr. Hinasaki. She looked exhausted and disoriented, but she was uninjured. Makoto had no idea what happened to her missing friends. The seven-year-old girl was informally adopted by Mr. Hinasaki. Not much is known about him, but he did provide a stable home for Makoto and never presumed to step in as her father. Makoto Munokata grew up got married, and had a daughter named Miyuki. Much like her grandmother Yai, Miyuki was sickly and very spiritually attuned. She was described as a weak and nervous person, but as she grew, she was able to suppress that extra sense. She'd inherited that special camera from her mother when she was a young adult, but she refrained from using it because she knew that it could cause her mental state harm and it could influence her. She tried to live a mostly normal life, but she was seen as heretical and weird by those around her. She went on to marry into the Hinasaki family, actually. She married a man named Masato Hinasaki, who was one of her professors. They had studied that special camera together and had traveled the region studying various ruins. The two went on to have two kids that they named Mifuyu and Miku. But Masato was a poor husband and a terrible father. He was never really present and was neglectful of his family, which tore his wife's heart apart. Miyuki raised Mifuyu and Miku as best as she could, but as time wore on, she became more and more ill, just like her grandmother had. When her children began to show signs of spiritual attunement, she helped them hide and suppress it so that they could have normal lives. At some point, Miyuki's husband and the father of her children died out in the field. It was just a random accident during his work. The years carried on and Miyuki became more unwell. She started using her old special camera as a hobby, but it began to damage her mind and bring her spiritual senses back to the surface. She obsessively used it, just as her grandmother had done, but nobody knew what was causing her intense decline. 
Her oldest, Mafuyu, was old enough that he wasn't really around home anymore, and the younger sibling, Miku, was too young to process her mother's actions. Miyuki could find no hope or salvation, and she took her own life by hanging herself in the garden, just as Yae had done years before at the Hamuro mansion. It was Miku that found her. The young girl was, of course, devastated, but her brother Mifuyu stepped in and made sure that his little sister was well taken care of. He raised her and acted as both mother and father figure to her. Mifuyu saw to his mother's affairs and her possessions. From her journal, he learned more about their spiritual attunements, which seemed to have affected Miku more than himself, and he learned about the camera. He kept these things hidden from Miku, not out of anything malicious, but just to protect his little sister. In 1986, when Miku was about 17, she began preparing for higher education. Mifuyu was in his 20s and working at a publishing company under a writer named Junsei Takamine. Takamine was needing a big, juicy story for his next book, and he decided that it would come from the Himuro Mansion. Takamine knew of the now long-dead Ryozo Munakata and his work covering the mansion, but he and his team couldn't find any of Ryozo's writings. The mountain was well known for a sprawling number of reported murders, which made for the perfect topic. The masses would just eat up all the carnage and gore. In August of 1986, an earthquake hit the mountain. Local news sources strangely wrote about the destruction of the Five Holy Mirrors, which represented protection over the region. Weird. Takamine believed that the earthquake itself was linked to something within the mansion, and he wanted to put it all into a book. So Takamine, his editor Koji, and his assistant Tomo all went to the mansion together on September 9th. When they arrived in the area, the locals were skittish and unhelpful. They warned the small team away from the mansion, but by nightfall, they'd found it. When they arrived, the entrance to the mansion was broken. They had to break their own way in. Their explorations began promptly the next morning, and so did the terrible troubles. Tomo was more spiritually sensitive than Takamine or Koji, and she started feeling and seeing some really frightening things on the first day. The group found disturbing photographs in a chest. One of them was a group of children playing demon tag. There was something terrifying about it. Then later that evening, Tomo saw a woman in front of a mirror near the entrance with long hair and a white kimono. She had ropes tied around her limbs that she dragged as she walked. The next morning, Tomo saw the female in the white kimono again, and it seemed like she was trying to tell Tomo something. She caught that the spirit's name was Kiri, but Tomo was desperately afraid of her and felt that she should not get any closer to the being. By that evening, the editor Koji was gone. Takamine and Tomo looked all over the huge estate, but they found no sign of him. Throughout the day, he had been talking about more ropes, but they'd all been under a lot of stress. They searched high and low, but it was like he just vanished into thin air. But still, they didn't abandon the mansion to seek help. Takamine and Tomo stayed. On the next day, the 12th of September, early in the morning, Tomo and Takamine found Koji. His limbs and head had been torn off his body. A photo of Koji's body was left near the corpse, and in it, Takamine saw that his limbs appeared to have ropes tied around them. He was able to connect the dots back to the rope shrine maiden, but he couldn't put the whole puzzle together. Not long after they found Koji's body, Tomo started sensing children around her playing demon tag. She believed that they were the children that played with Makoto so long ago. At some point, she became separated from Takamine, and she found a room full of severed heads. Somehow, she knew that it was done by the leader of the Hamuro family. They were all trying to tell her something, but she couldn't make out what. Over the course of that day, Tomo completely lost touch with reality and became inconsolable. She saw the rush of people throughout the mansion when the calamity happened. She kept seeing Kiri. Her mind kept returning to the broken, holy mirror pieces. She believed they were the key to everything, and she had to tell Takamine how to break the curse on the mansion. The two found each other again, but all she could get out was babbling nonsense. Finally, the next day, on the 13th of September, Takamine decided that they needed to leave the mansion. But by then, Tomo was in such terrible shape that he couldn't even get her to move. So, he left her and looked for a way out all on his own. But oh, it was far too late. He couldn't find an exit. The spirits and the curse of the mountain wouldn't let him leave. When he found there was no way out, he went back to Tomo, only to find her being strangled to death in a courtyard by the vengeful spirit of Kiri. He would be next, he knew. But still, he didn't give up. He found Tomo's notes about the pieces of the holy mirror. Her writing said that the complete true mirror had been broken long ago and that the earthquake that hit a month prior were just symptoms of trouble brewing in the mountain. The earthquake had not broken the complete mirror. It could be reassembled and used to stop whatever was happening. 
Over the course of a day, Takamine found four of the five mirror pieces. He believed that he knew where the fifth one was, but he failed to write down that bit of information in his notes. He left a final note detailing his plan, and he asked whoever found it to find Tomo's body and to give her a decent burial. Takamine never made it to the fifth piece. Kiri found him, and he died a terrible death within one of the shrines. And then, once again, Hamuro Mansion laid empty. Missing persons reports were filed. No bodies were found. Mafuyu Hinasake immediately noticed when Takamine, Koji, and Tomo vanished. He held Takamine in high regard, and when investigations into the disappearances didn't yield results, he made the decision to go take things into his own hands. Mafuyu told his little sister Miku that he had a lead on where Takamine had gone to, and he took his mother's strange camera, fully aware of its capabilities, and he went to Hamuro Mansion alone on September 24th, 1986. Most folk with common sense would take one look at this place and nope the hot hell out, but not Mifuyu and the countless victims that came before him. Mifuyu walked right into the mansion in the dead of night, turned on his flashlight, and started searching. Very little sense of self-preservation in this one. There was a cacophony of moaning men echoing around the building. Despite it all, Mifuyu pressed on, intent on finding his peers. Before going too far, he decides that he'll take notes and leave them on his path, just in case someone comes looking for him. And down... The rope hallway. Before you find his first apparition, a male figure slowly walking alone, which he snaps a photograph of. This doesn't shake the young guy either. He doesn't miss a step. He doesn't turn around. He keeps pushing farther into the mansion with no hesitation. Even when he comes across more spirits, Mifuyu just takes his picture and keeps going. One of Mr. Takamine's research notebooks is out in the open, and touching it gives Mifuyu a flash of past events, of things they unknowingly encountered. Spirits were creeping on them as soon as they arrived, though they couldn't see them. Numerous hands reaching out of the darkness for them, and no one saw the corrupted spirit of the rope shrine maiden Kiri watching them down a corridor. When Mifuyu's senses return, an angry spirit is approaching him with foul intent. His mother's camera repels it, saving his life, and cueing him in on just how to handle aggressive spirits. From here on, Mifuyu is open game to anything that tracks him down within the mansion, and there's no end to the enraged spirits that want to disembowel him. Well over 1,300 people have died on these grounds, and if even 1% of them were trapped here and angry, it'd still spell trouble for anyone here to explore. After a series of dead ends, Mifuyu finds himself back in the rope hallway, and someone is waiting for him. Kiri. Two weeks later, Mifuyu's little sister takes action. Miku was done waiting for Mifuyu to pop back up. He had told her and left her a note detailing where he'd gone and she was going to follow. It led her right to Himuro Mansion, in the dead of night. And just like her brother, she didn't even give a second consideration to what she was doing. She waltzed right on in. Miku was far more spiritually sensitive than her brother and she started getting disturbing flashes as soon as she was in the foyer. The pure spirit of Kiri called to her asking for help. Then, not far away, she saw the visage of the editor Koji and found a note from him. It was shortly before his death when he started seeing ropes appearing around his limbs and images. Down that rope hallway, Miku finds her mother's special camera that Mifuyu had brought with him. And now the fun can really begin. Touching it, she sees a bit of what happened to Mifuyu. He was running down a hall with ghostly arms trying to grab him. A young woman was in pursuit. A young woman that Miku glimpses in a mirror when she snaps back to her senses. Well... Mifuyu left his camera here with a note that outlines a bit of the history of the mansion, and nothing that he entails is promising. If it wasn't extremely clear to Miku before, then it should be now. This place is bad news. There are certain things that just shouldn't be tampered with. Ouija boards, voodoo, and haunted Japanese mansions with a history of strangling rituals and mass murder. Print it on a t-shirt, I stand by it. There's a ghost corpse dangling on a beam in the rope hallway. How does that statement make you feel? Because this will become the new norm for Miku as she goes through the Himuro mansion. Grisly deaths captured in time that only she can see through her mother's camera. But as so many before her have witnessed, it's not just corpses and sad spirits here. There are many angry and confused souls that try to latch onto or lash out against her, and her only defense against it is that camera which means she has to look at them. She has to face them down, and if she can't outright see them through the lens, she doesn't just get to look away and guess, she has to seek out the horror. Some of them scream, others will cry and wail, some beg for help, and ever-present is the threat of running out of film. The only reprieve she'll get is from the pure spirit of Kiri, 
who desperately wishes that someone would cleanse the mansion and free the lost spirits within it. And the only aid she'll receive is from the past, people who came before and left behind messages, tapes, and notes that will help her piece together the story. The front section of the mansion is slow and difficult. She struggles to get her bearings, learn the rules of the spirits, and the estate itself is a bit of a puzzle. Doors are barred or locked, stairs are collapsed, spirits will emerge from nowhere and attack, and sometimes she has to take images of certain areas to reveal secrets in other places of the mansion. It requires backtracking and remembering prior locations and objects within them. The first death Miku has to contend with is Koji. She saw visions of him trying to hide from the spirits, trying to flee. She finds a photograph that depicts ropes around his limbs. The poor, poor man. He was the first of Mafuyu's peers to be killed. The closer she gets to realizing the full story, the more his hostile spirit appears. And shortly after, Tomo's spirit begins to appear. She and Takamine had seen photos with ropes around his limbs, and they'd found his body after he'd been torn apart. So Tomo knew what those ropes meant. Her notes, too, are scattered around the estate. Miku can piece together her sad decline, made all the more tragic by her pensiveness in coming here in the first place. It felt wrong to her, but she wanted to work with Takamine. Every step will be more difficult than the last, each angry spirit more dangerous, and ever faintly in the distance are the cries of those who have met violent deaths here. This place is hell, and Miku refuses to back down. But let's be honest, even if she panicked and wanted to flee, Kiri wouldn't let her go, not at this point. She's learned of the strangling ritual and the rope shrine maiden, how Koji was torn apart, that Tomo was tortured and strangled in a courtyard, and the man named Takamene was murdered in a shrine, all by the same terrible spirit in the white kimono named Kiri. Mifuyu had come here to find them, and if these were the fates they'd met, then what happened to her brother? Miku learned of the five mirror pieces as well and began searching them out around the mansion. Her first night came to a head when she solved the mystery of one of the Buddha shrines, and she found her first mirror piece. At this point, she knows that these are important and will help cleanse this wretched place. But once she has the first piece, Kiri appears. She is so powerful within this mountain that she uses mirrors to pass between places and is fully tangible before Miku. The confrontation is a short one. Miku has nowhere to run, and Kiri's pursuit will never cease. The rope maiden catches her prey, but Miku does not die. Something saves the teenager, or perhaps Kiri spares her. With the terrible spirit's touch, Miku sees the rope ritual taking place, and she is the victim. Miku dreams of demon tag being played around her, as though she were the blinded maiden. There's nothing innocent about this game. It victimized so many little girls. She awakens within a doll room, and there are ghastly ropes around her wrists. What happened to Koji, Tomo, and Takamine is happening to her. She might not have to face death yet, but this is a mark of what is to come. She will be strangled. She lost a full day after Kiri caught her. Now, it's the second night. But the first dilemma. A little shit has stolen her mirror piece, and she has to get that back from them. During this night, Miku is made aware of the Munakata family and their lives here in the mansion. The father, Ryoza, was a writer that became interested in the mansion after visiting the area. His wife, Yai, was a sickly, frail woman. Their daughter, Makoto, did well in the area, and she made many friends with the local kids. But tragedy came to them when Makoto found that strange camera and the spirits of the mountain began to haunt the family. The little girl went missing, Yai hung herself, driven insane by losing her daughter and using that strange camera too much, and Ryoza was killed by Kiri in the underground, near the demon mouth. He'd managed to open it with the blinding mask, but then it was game over for him. The little asshole that stole the mirror piece is eventually tracked down and proves to be a bit of an obstacle to banish, far more dangerous and wily than one would have expected of a child. The sounds of children laughing and calling for help at the same time is just really extremely off-putting, but Miku manages to banish the spirit and reclaim the vitally important piece of mirror. She's uncovered much of the estate grounds by now, at least what's above ground, and the journey through it is slow and difficult. Macabre puzzles are around each corner, and the spirit hostility from the previous night seems far more intense now. The first great horror of the night comes from witnessing part of the past, the blinding ritual. Before the strangling ritual was held, the maiden selected 10 years prior from Demon Tag is taken away from her family, and the blinding mask is forced upon her face. Her blood would be part of the key into the demon mouth, and once her part was played, her fate was left a mystery. But a small hope is found when Miku comes across a note left by Mifuyu. He says that the woman in the white kimono, Kiri, she didn't kill him, she let him go, and he's trying to find a way to appease her so that nobody else is harmed by her. So there's a very good chance that her brother is still alive on the mountain somewhere. One of the few beautiful places left here is the room where the blinding ritual was held. 
It feels pristine all these many years after its final use, and the mask itself is safely stored here. She doesn't know it yet, but this will be deviously useful very soon. It takes some fumbling around to make heads or tails of where to go next, but Miku eventually finds herself within the demon mouth. There are beings of the past here, waiting for anyone that can be preyed upon. A blinded maiden from long ago attacks. It's not the first time the wailing calls of the blinded have called to Miku, but she knows fully what happened to them now. Their calls of pain were because of the mask that was forced onto them. They cry over their eyes because they were pierced. Miku sends the spirit away, but banishment doesn't ease their pain. Their screams and cries continue until the very bitter end. Placing the blinding mask into the door lock shows Miku the death of Ryozo. By this point, his daughter was missing and his wife had taken her own life. He knew that there would be no leaving this mansion, and he pursued the depths of the mountain to uncover its secrets. His death was certainly no surprise, and now stands as a warning to Miku of what lies ahead. She finds his mummified body just past the gate, still grasping a piece of the holy mirror. Now she has two, and once again Kiri appears. Miku tries to fight back this time to take a photo of the spirit, but nothing she does affects her. Kiri is much too powerful for that, so Miku is forced to run through the underground, forced to flee. But the dead block her way to freedom, preventing her from escaping. Kiri once again places her hands upon Miku, taking her consciousness away. In her dreams, she sees suffering and panic, Kiri being torn apart, the strangling ritual taking place, the dead around the mansion after the calamity began, the family leader hunting people down, the Hamuro family and those that called the mountain home all wiped out in one terrible night. When next she awakens, it is the third night. Carrie has not yet killed her, but there are ropes appearing around her ankles now. She's back before the demon mouth. Once again venturing in, Ryoza's body is gone and she has only one path to follow. It takes her to a pile of fallen rocks that she cannot pass, but on the other side of it she sees her brother. He doesn't respond to her though. When she calls to him, he just walks away, like he doesn't even register that she's there. This night, Miku learns more about the calamity itself and the major loss of life that took place when Kiri failed as the Rope Shrine Maiden. It was all a very personal family affair, and it's right to call it a calamity. There was so much pain for everyone involved. With any way forward blocked now, Miku tries to exit the banned path, but the pure spirit of Kiri intervenes and shows her a scrap of research that Riozo had on him when he died. It was about the Moon Shrine, a place that Miku had been to before, but there was nothing there. But the note details that at the bottom of the well is a door, which the Rope Shrine Maiden would follow to reach the Hellgate. So while this path may be blocked off, there is still the Moon Shrine path that she can follow. Good news, she'll need to find it and she'll need a key, but this is wonderful given the circumstances. It will require some investigation though. Miku has trekked and backtracked enough throughout the estate that it's easier for her to make her way to where she needs to be. Though, if memory serves, there was the issue of the well leading into the moon shrine being covered up. Without any way around that, she won't even be able to reach it. En route, Miku finds another Buddha room, which held ceremonial ropes used in the strangling rituals. Deciphering its secrets gets her a strange carved stone, and with that, a memory from the past. It's of the Hamuro family leader chasing a man down within this room after he was driven mad by the malice of the calamity. He brutally murdered countless from his own family that night, and now his spirit will try to do the same to Miku. While he chases her around, he says terrible things and wishes death upon the girl. There is no guilt felt in banishing this fetid being. It's hard to say what he was like in life, but in death he is a righteous bastard, and casting him away allows her to proceed on. At the cherry atrium, that strange teal carved stone is the key to unlocking another shrine door, progress. And within this strange shrine is a cabinet. And with that is, weirdly, another research scrap from that man Riozo. It details a mystery involving this cabinet and it's linked to the moon well. Well, that is just what Miku needs. To unlock the mechanisms will allow access to the well. Miku needs the symbols of the four masked priests and the Hamuro family leader seal. Ryoza was never quite able to figure it out since the old priests and the family master were long dead, but taking photos of the pedestals around the cabinet reveal each location that Miku can find these pieces at. It will take her back out into the cherry atrium just outside, the square garden, the backyard near the well, and a place called the Abyss. Each stop will require fighting the spirits of the long dead priests, though their death calls are encouraging Miku to hurry, to carry on, to cleanse this place, to see the old ritual complete. Miku learned why Kiri failed, that she fell in love, became attached to the world. In the priests' confusions, they questioned why Kiri did this. How could this have even happened? 
putting their symbols into the cabinet back at the shrine doesn't quite have the results one might expect. Blood begins to seep from the front of it, creating a trail for her to follow. It leads her all the way back into the Grand Hall. The Hamuro family master is back. He uses the heads of his victims against her this time and takes lethal slashes at her as they chase one another around the hall. It's one hell of a fight, but Miku prevails, barely. Once he's banished, she claims the master's seal, the last thing that she needs to unlock the Buddha shrine so that she can descend into the well. At the bottom of it, Miku finds another piece of the mirror. Her collection is nearly complete. And just as before, Kiri appears to chase the girl down. Miku tries to flee, does her best to escape by making it back up out of the well, but there's no way that Kiri is just going to give up. Ropes have appeared on her wrists and her ankles, and next will be her throat. Just before Kiri reaches her, at the top of the well, the good part of the rope shrine maiden appears and takes Miku's hand. She will protect Miku from herself, shield her from any more harm. In her dreams, the good part of Kiri calls to Miku, desperately asking her for help. And when next she awakens, it's the fourth and final night. Greeting her once again as she awakens is the pure Kiri, the one with that dead-eyed stare. The spirit points her towards a kodo to nudge Miku in the right direction, and then she's gone. Within this room is some sheet music that, luckily, she can read. It's a familiar song that she can pick out on the kodo. Playing it opens one of the doors, leading up into the attic, because nothing bad ever happens in an attic. A few suspicious holes, a couple fights, and a traumatic memory later, this path takes Miku to a strange, caged room. This is where the Rope Shrine Maidens spent most of their lives, until their complete dedication and compliance was gained. They couldn't be allowed to have earthly ties, so they were imprisoned here. Kiri's old diary still remains all these years later. The priests knew of her attachments to a certain young man. They'd made sure that he was killed and lied to her about his fate. But their evil deeds didn't fix anything. Everything fell apart in the end. The good spirit of Kiri left Miku a gift, another part of the Holy Mirror. She's just missing one piece now. And she left her the Rope Shrine Maiden's hairpin, which was the key to the Maiden's path in the well. Without these, Miku would have been dead in the water, so to speak. And then she treats Miku to a not-safe-for-work flashback when she held the hand of a young man in a courtyard so long ago. It's unfortunate that this was the catalyst for over 1,300 people's deaths, but again, I guess just take the happiness where you can get it. But this young fellow from the past, he looks a lot like Mifuyu, which puts into perspective perhaps why Kiri hasn't murdered Mifuyu. But that sure as hell doesn't mean that he's safe. And, well, he might be in some serious trouble if an evil spirit is wanting to claim him for eternity. Consent is important, even for ghosts. As Miku is leaving, she spots the good spirit of Kiri again, sort of leading her down the hall. But the evil aspect of the maiden isn't far behind. She again pursues, but nothing gets in Miku's way this time. Her path is clear to flee. There's zero hesitation in it. She knows that she cannot stop Kiri. She knows that Kiri will tear her apart if she gets her hands on her. All the teenager can do is run away just to buy more time. She does manage to lose Kiri outside and beelines back for that shrine that led down into the mood well. She had been cut off from proceeding before, but this time she has a clear path and the key for it. It leads Miku to the banned path, where the family leader, four priests, family congregants, and the rope shrine maiden continued on to carry out the strangling ritual. While the congregants waited outside beyond closed doors, the priest and the family leader killed the maiden. Miku sees Kiri's death on the altar. It was so apparent that the process was corrupted, but there was no other choice. It was too late to find another maiden. And all these years later, the altar is still stained red from the many victims that it took. Down one last hallway, Miku reaches her final destination, the Hell Gate itself. With bloody ropes in hand, the priests, family leader, and remaining congregants came here to change out the ropes. The Holy Mirror repelled any spirits who might try to escape while they worked, but Kiri had sabotaged the mirror to break, and she herself was an unsuitable rope shrine maiden. The rope change was a failure, and the gates of hell swung open, malice poured out, and the calamity took place. Mufuyu, he's here, but the lights aren't on, so to speak. He's unresponsive, just standing there, staring. And the evil aspect of Kiri shows herself to be possessive over him, refusing to let him act, though he's trying to reach out for his sister. Rather than allow Miku to be a distraction, Kiri absorbs the young man into herself and then attacks his sister. One last time, and there's no escape route. Miku sprints to put as much distance as possible between herself and Kiri. Any hits that she lands can be lethal, so Miku needs to be aware of where she is and act as aggressive as possible. And a few times, Kiri gets damn close to her. But in the end, Kiri is dangerous, but she's not difficult to take down. 
Miku lays a beat down on her, but in retaliation, Kiri lashes out and breaks the special camera. If she can't outright win, then she'll break the rules. And now there's some real trouble because Miku doesn't have any defenses or the final piece of the holy mirror. But the good spirit of Kiri once again intervenes. She shows Miku that the final piece of the holy mirror was in the camera. And now that it's busted, she only needs to pick up that final piece. Miku rushes for it, and as soon as it's in her hand, the rest of the pieces emit a strange light and pull itself together into its complete form. In its proper resting place, it repels all the malice within Kiri back into hell. Now freed from the influence of evil, Kiri is in her natural form, and the remaining good spirit steps forward to remind her of her obligations. She must still complete the strangling ritual and hold shut the gates of hell, and this time, she will eternally commit to this torment. Her chance at a peaceful death has long since passed. Her spirit will remain here, hanging before the hell gate, keeping it closed. She is truly committed to her fate now. She tells Miku and Mifuyu to leave her here, to flee the mansion. The estate is beginning to crumble and they don't have very long to make it out. But Mifuyu decides to stay. He will die with Kiri at his side and he will remain here eternally to help her fulfill this terrible obligation. He just tells Miku to go, go on without him and then she's alone. In a strange dream, she hears Mifuyu speaking to her, explaining his decision. He's felt Kiri's sadness, and he knows her lonely fate. She will hang here in perpetual torment, keeping the gate closed, and if he can offer her any reprieve from that, then he will gladly stay at her side. When she awakens, she's free from her Murrow mansion, and so are all those that died here during and after the calamity. Hundreds of tiny lights float up into the clear sky, finally able to venture on to where they belong. And after that night, Miku stopped seeing things that other people could not see.